Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest tonight is Milton Glaser, who professionally is known as an outstanding art director. But perhaps the reason that he is so outstanding is that he is, in addition, a humanist, a philosopher, a gourmet, and a graphic artist whose combined talent has changed the face of what we read and see in American publications. He is also a very nice man. A warm welcome to you, Milton. Thank you, Barbara Lee. In your varied work, is there some ruling or guiding artistic principle or standard? I suddenly feel like Mel Brooks. <laughs> uh, yes, there's a guiding principle. The guiding principle is clarity. How do you take a piece of information or some original reference point and translate it visually? How do you do that? Well, I suppose what you're talking about is really the heart of a designer's work, which is essentially exactly that, which is the transference of information from one point to another. Sorry. And the way you do that depends on the peculiarities of the job. I mean, you do it somewhat differently in every case. One of the things you have to understand about the profession of being a designer is that at its heart, it is responsive to external requirements. See, the difference between being a designer and being an artist is that the obligation of the design profession is problem solving, or as you put it, taking a piece of information from one point to another. That's a central and guiding intention. The real difference is the external imperative that as an artist, the way we seem to define it, it is the uh, internal need that is the most significant role that's acted out by the artist, which is say you have a vision, the vision is either in some way obsessive or compelling. You want to manifest that as a primary thing in your life. And uh, the fact that it is understood or that it's responded to is really quite secondary to that internal need to externalize it. And the issue of success or reward also seems to be secondary to that basic need. But its principal psychic intention is to externalize an interior vision. Now, with design, the reason for the confusion about the two issues is that very often the training for both is the same. You go to the same art school, you learn the same rules, same techniques, and so on. But with design, the combination of the external demand for transfer of information or to represent something that exists in the world and take it from one place to another, or to tell people what's going on, or to convince people, uh, about a fact is equally significant. So design at its best, and it's not always this, represents the synthesis of trying to get that external demand, which is to convey information, with the internal demand, which is visionary or personal, and make, somehow fit them together in some way which raises this terrible question of being innovated, uh, innovative or being new or being fresh or being original or in fact being creative as the much abused word is uh, bandied about. You see, the real problem is that what is creative, and always in my mind I always have quotes around that word, what is creative is invariably what has not already been experienced and then by definition cannot be understood. So you see why the idea of being creative and the idea of being a person involved with transferring information is at some points in opposition to one another. If creative, in fact, deals with what is not already known, the real question becomes, how do you make what is not known, known? Am I getting too obscure in this issue? Not yet. Issue? Okay. Who influenced your work? Did you have a philosophical mentor? A philosoph no, I don't think I had a An aesthetic one? Mentor. I had many. Yes, I'll tell you what the center. I realize now that my real mentor uh, was Picasso in a peculiar way. 
You're abandoning, abandoning Piero? No, and to, Piero wasn't uh, a mentor. He was just someone to be admired. No, the thing that I learned from Picasso was that you could discard your own history to some extent and, uh, and keep moving. See, the one thing that Picasso demonstrated by virtue of his performance over a lifetime was that you, you did not have to feel bound by a, a single stylistic convention. You, you, as you know, the path of an artist up until Picasso virtually was always the same. It was early confusion, um, apprenticeship, development of an early style, refinement of that style, uh, success at that style, and then you died. Now, what Picasso demonstrated was that you could be a, a cubist, a synthetic cubist, and a surrealist, and a romantic, and naturalistic, and all that stuff, and that the issue of quality, which is to say that you could maintain quality in all of those stylistic positions. And I suppose that was the most important thing to me as far as understanding that style did not have to be an ongoing committed position in life, that you could in fact take and embrace a number of styles in your lifetime that were entirely contradictory to one another. And you have, and we'll get more into that later. With whom did you study? Uh, well, I, I started studying formally when I was 13 years old with Moses Sawyer, one of the three Sawyer brothers, right here on 14th Street and 5th Avenue, 15th Street and 5th Avenue. And I remember at the age of 13 going into my first life class, seeing a naked woman, it was just absolutely terrifying, but that passed <laughs> for a while. That was my, the beginning of my uh, formal study, and then I went to the High School of Music and Art after I had drawn for many years in, in a, out of a life class situation, and I went to the Art Students League, and then I went to Cooper Union. Then I had a Fulbright, and I studied with Giorgio Morandi in uh, Bologna. In a very, was that a very influential period? Extremely, yeah. I, I would say that of my, uh, my post-teenage life that was most significant uh, artistic and perhaps philosophical uh, period of my life where, I, in fact, now that I look back on it, uh, Morandi was in many ways uh, a man I admired deeply and was very influenced by, mostly because of his um, refusal to accept the traditional role of the artist in society that many of his contemporaries accepted, which is to say, I don't know if you know, if the audience is very familiar with his work, but he's essentially an artist who uh, does still lives of bottles and landscapes. Very few uh, portraits or people in his painting. A very modest man, a fabulous etcher, and a marvelous painter, painter of great tonal beauty. Uh, and at the time I was studying with him, I was uh, 20, 20 or 21, and he was already uh, one of the most famous artists in Italy. And he never left Bologna, which is a small, somewhat provincial northern Italian town. Actually, not as provincial as it might seem, because it's a... Uh, I say provincial because tourists don't go there, but basically it's a, it's a lively... Uh, and a politically active town. But it's relatively unknown by Americans because it has no great tourist attractions. At any rate, he was very happy never to move to Paris, never to move outside of Bologna, never to charge more than $200 for a painting, even at a time when his dealers were getting $14,000 for them. And what you could do with Morandi was you, you could order a painting from him for which he charged $200, and what he would do is he'd write your name on the back of a canvas, a blank canvas, a small one, and he'd put it up, and then during the course of the next five years, he'd do a painting, and after he finished the painting, he'd turn it over and see who it belonged to, and then he'd send it to you. Did but you? I, I just, well, the only point I wanted to make about that was that, that whole total refusal to get involved in the mechanism of fame, success, accomplishment, money, was something that uh, I found enormously uh, compelling. It's often been said that your work contains a lot of inside art historical jokes. 
Why don't you amuse us and tell us about some of them? <laughs> well, I'll remind you. I obviously, the most widely uh, refer to is the Dylan poster. Well, I don't think that's a historical joke. Well, maybe, yes, okay. Well, I wrote a little piece on the Dylan poster, and somebody asked me what the inspiration for it was, and I said that, uh, as far as I could trace, one of the inspirations for it was a, a cutout that um, Marcel Duchamp did uh, in a self-portrait, just a little paper cutout. Silhouette. Uh, silhouette. And I, uh, I sort of had that in the back of my mind as something that I found particularly interesting. And then I combined it with some form, I'm very interested in Middle Eastern painting, that Islamic, sort of a Turkish kind of, particular kind of color range and formal qualities of swirling forms. And I sort of did that in the hair. So it's, that particular piece came out of that, uh, if I had to try to objectify what made me do it out of those two things. And then I always look at the history of painting as just more information. And uh, I, as you know, artists tend to learn more from art than they do from nature. And so I've always looked at the history of art as merely a kind of a source book for information. For instance, the, as you noticed here, in this poster, which is a poster for uh, NARIS, an association of uh, people in the music business, the landscape behind the tree is uh, taken right out of one of Piero della Francesca's paintings of northern Italy, and that kind of thing. But I, I guess my feeling about art is that it is, more than anything else, a resource for additional information and in some way enriching surfaces, both in a, from a literary point of view and from a formal or plastic point of view. In fact, you can only begin to work when you begin to erode some of the consciousness around those sources. And where you don't begin to say, well, I take a piece from here and a piece from there. Well, what happens, one of the dangers of an eclectic attitude or the sense of piecemeal putting things together is they never come together, is that they remain as sort of undigested pieces of information. And one of the things you have to deal with as a designer is how you make these elements in some way synthesize so that they don't assert their own authority by saying, reminding you that, well, there's a piece of that, a piece of that. Because the experience of a piece of design at its best is seamless. You don't know where one thing begins and the other thing ends. And the energy and the conviction of the piece has to come through as a single experience rather than understanding what, it's like cooking a great meal where you don't really want to be conscious of the separate ingredients, but rather the total experience that you get from it uh, when it's properly combined. So even though the sources of information may be random, the work cannot be successful if the viewer is conscious of their randomness, that they have to in some way be digested. And that's true of a painting as well as it is of a design. Why do you work in so many styles? Well, I was trying to explain, I, I really can't tell you the real reason. I can tell you some ideas I've had about it. Uh, I have no explanation for it outside of, uh, I have some explanations for it. Maybe it is the absence of belief. I really can't believe anything about art, you see. I mean, I don't believe that art is a single mode. I mean, I could never, be, I don't believe in abstraction. I don't believe in, in reality. I don't believe in lyricism and I don't believe in uh, hard forms. I don't believe in romantic as opposed to classic. I mean, I don't, I can't seem to ever come down with a decision about what, what art really is. I have no conviction about arts. So I'm convinced it's illusion. And I'm convinced that any belief about art is essentially a way of stopping your perception, see, as it is about anything else. What do you, from what do you start? I mean, what's the impetus for you to start? What's square one for you? Well, one of the reasons I'm really a designer is that square one is always external demand. You see? I mean, square one is always somebody calling on the telephone and says, by next Wednesday, I need a cover from, uh, what? that's square one. And it's one of, the <coughs> one of the reasons that 
I've, I'm almost Pavlovian that way. I don't, unless I have something explicit to solve, I don't do anything. Are you saying the impetus is literary then? A piece of information that... Well, it's... Uh, oh, oh, I'm saying, first of all, it's external. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's expressed in a problem that's being asked to be solved by somebody else. I say almost, you know, almost always that is the... So you're saying that you're reactive that rather than absolutely. initiative in yes, your work. absolutely true. Well, watching you spin off ideas in places, it's sort of hard to believe, really. Um, one of your best known pieces of work, perhaps because of its publishing success, is New York Magazine. Would you tell us, as best you can from start to finish, how do you lay out a magazine? And how do you personally lay out New York or New West Magazine? What's that process? Uh, okay. Now, a magazine, like many other things that designers get involved with, is a collection of energy and information. Now, you, magazine, the form of a magazine is bound more than any other single thing by the time involved in its preparation and the frequency of its appearance, which both of those facts have some relationship to one another. Which is to say that a, a newspaper has a different demand as far as its formal qualities than a magazine that comes out every week. And a magazine that comes out bi-weekly has a very different structure than a magazine that comes out monthly, which has a very different appearance from a publication that comes out quarterly, etc. So the first thing that really is the, a constraint in designing a magazine is the time involved in, its, in the experience of designing it, putting it together, and its frequency. To be more specific, uh, a, ma a product that comes out daily, like a newspaper, the reader is much more willing to tolerate mistakes, lack of refinement, crudity, etc., etc. I mean, you're, you're much more ready to accept the fact that there are more typos in the New York Post. Well, there are more typos in the New York Post than anything in the world, but <laughs> the fact that it's a daily magazine, a daily newspaper, makes it very easy to accept the lack of uh, refinement. A weekly, you make somewhat more demands on, particularly when it's a slick weekly. The change of surface in this case, from newsprint to slick paper, also begins to act upon the viewer as an element where the form itself has to accommodate the frequency. Not only that, but the actual size of the page of an object, which in terms of reading patterns means that you read so much before you turn the page has to be one of the consideration of the language you use, which is one of the reasons that Time Magazine developed Time Ease, which is that kind of language which tends to condense language because of the frequency of turning the page. You see, you don't have to condense language as much in a large format as you do in a small format. One of the reasons is it's very hard to turn that page. You think it's easy, but it's, there's a psychic load in turning a page. It's very hard to bring people around the page because very often you find your own experience. When you come to an end of a story, if you're not interested, you end it where the page ends and you continue on in the book for something else. So the requirement is for a very easy reading experience, which means what you use is a system that is very constant. You don't use fancy layouts in a magazine like New York because the issue is not beauty of layout but clarity of information. In order to be clear, you keep all the clues constant. Same size headed, heads, the same size and position of the subheads, the same kinds of captions, and a very austere and unobtrusive design system so that you're never conscious of the fact that it was designed at all, but rather that it was put together in the most accessible way. So that the reader, you'll find that New York Magazine is very easy to read. I mean, at least I hope it is, that you get through it very quickly. If you don't want to read it, you can go through reading headlines, subheads, and getting fragments, and almost experience the magazine in 10 or 15 minutes. Then if so you there want to is that back, filmic quality in the caption subheads, just as there often is at the top of a, or bottom of a page, uh, pictorially. Yes. How influential is film on your work? Well, it's influenced particularly, I mean, because I view 
magazines as a kinetic experience. The turning page. An assemblage as well? Well, it's an assembly of information and it's experience in time. The turning page is really a time bound experience. So I also you notice that the illustrations in New York Magazine te tend to be sequence illustration very often. We'll have a joke that goes over several pages and pay off. That's almost what like I meant a little, is the film strip quality. But that's the thing that's always interested me about magazine is its relationship to motion and time. And how do you get quality control when you have a workshop, so to speak? Well, on a lot of things, I don't... Um, what I've tried to do is figure out, which I really had to clear my head about this one because I always felt uh, attached to the issue of the handmade object and the authenticity mm -hmm. of that issue, but I finally said I can get through that. Um, I, one of They'll the, rationalize for us, too. Fine. Yeah. One of the... I reached a certain point in my life where I, I realized that I had to increase my productivity See, because I was working as hard as I could and I was only doing a third of the amount of work that I had to do. And I tried to figure out a method that could produce more work and uh, maintain the quality and uh, st still have some kind of authenticity in the way it was done. And what I did was actually a very simple-minded uh, notion, which is the same device that animation uses, which is to essentially establish the skeleton or the forms in a linear way, defined by outline, and then assign somebody to physically fill them in. In this case, we use a material that's sort of a color film that can be cut out and with a wax backing rubbed down and fills the form. So for instance, Rene. all the color on this poster, this, A Star is Born, oh wait, maybe we have something here, hold on. No, that's, that's the only one that's done that way. All the color on this poster was put in by an assistant. I didn't do any. All I did here was the black and white drawing. But you see, the quality of drawing itself is such that all the forms are enclosed. And so out of the formal qualities came out of a technical requirement, in this case, providing a guide for someone to fill color into. So that's one of the reasons that one of the ways I work is this kind of Who selects drawing. the color? Well, I do. And how but, do you get uh, control of the quality of something that someone else has done for you? Well, because all they're doing is, is following the color scheme that you, you know, you say, use this, use Y3R here, BG2 here. It's all like that joke with people telling jokes, they know so well they do it by punchline, you know, number 32. The guy doesn't laugh, he says, what's wrong? He says, you didn't tell it well. You know, anyway, it's the same thing here, that you, once you have the outline... What happens when they don't draw it well? Well, they don't draw it. I mean, there's no drawing involved. The draw, I do the drawing, and all they do is cut the stuff and fit it. However, I must say, on something like this, for instance, the drawing may have taken, let's say it took 12 hours. The coloring may have taken 30. In fact, the people I work with on this thing, and particularly your assistant, an associate I have named George Levitt can color five times as fast as I can. So if I had to do the coloring, it might take me a hundred hours. But he's so skillful at it now that it just moves along. And the effect is exactly the same as if I had cut the film and put it down. So once you get into the, a, a form of work where the methodology does not change the final appearance, then the ideological issue of whether it belongs to you or not is not as uh, critical. One of the difficulties, too, talking about your own work is, uh, you know, a less, what appear, might appear to be a less than modest approach to it. So let me quote what Emilio Ambaz, the curator of the show of your work that was held at the Museum of Modern Art, said in a catalog to that show. I think it was something like, by the early 70s, Milton Glaser had become the nearest thing to a cultural hero that American graphic design had produced. What, in your mind, is your most significant contribution? Um, I think my most significant contribution was in somewhat breaking down the uh, compartments 
between certain kinds of visual activities that uh, had become rather institutionalized. I mean, only breaking them down to a point where they were perhaps back to what they were at another time, which is to say, for instance, that in this profession of designer, whatever that is, there are categories of activities such as illustrator, letterer, art director, uh, etc., etc. And uh, my particular appetite and interest sort of flopped over into many of those. So I do art direction and I do illustration and I design letter forms and I do now exhibitions of three dimensional stuff which is normally reserved for a profession called industrial designers and so on. So I, all I did for myself, out of my own, as I say, uh, low boredom threshold or whatever, was to try to mess around with a lot of different, uh, well, all right, to use the terminology of the 60s, become a generalist, a visual generalist, and work in a lot of areas at, at once and demonstrate that the particular parochialization that occurs in the profession is not necessarily a, uh, a fixed boundary for people if they're willing to take the risks of, uh, you know, making a mistake and humiliating yourself and doing something badly. If you had it to do over, what would you do otherwise? Mm. I'm sure I wouldn't have done anything otherwise. Besides, I'm assuming I will have it to do over. <laughs>